Good morning, EM. Welcome to our online church service this morning. Thank you for being here and worshiping God with me together. Right away to combat all of the horrible news that we see every single day on the news and on social media, uh, here are a couple of uplifting stories in our In Case You Missed It. First up, in case you missed it, this past week, scientists in Madagascar actually uh, discovered a brand new animal species. Uh, it's a brand new lizard that they're calling a nano chameleon. Now this thing is so tiny, it's actually smaller than a grown person's fingertip. It's so cute, it's actually uh, one of the smallest animals known that we know of. And it seriously looks like someone just took a normal sized chameleon and shrunk it down to the size of your finger. Um, this thing is so, so cute. And next, in case you missed it, uh, there was a couple in Ireland this past week who actually lost their dog. They, their dog had gone missing for two whole weeks after they went hiking. Um, and another couple just coincidentally happened to be hiking that same um, area after they, the other couple had lost their dog. Um, and they found the dog shivering and cold. Um, it was freezing cold and they found it. It couldn't even move and it couldn't even bark, that's how cold it was. And so the guy took the dog and put it on his shoulders and then carried it down the uh, hiking trail 10 kilometers and then they finally returned the dog to its original owner and the owners were so happy because they, they thought for sure that they had lost their dog. So just a really heartwarming story of a dog that came home. Now that's all I have for you for uplifting stories this morning. And so hopefully they lifted your spirit up a little bit um, in, in a world where we hear bad news all the time. Hopefully got you in a praising mindset. Now here is your meme of the week. And here is your song of the week. You can check this one out on Spotify. Just search up for our shared playlist. Uh, search up EM First Korean Playlist and you'll find it there. Now I only have one announcement for us this morning. We weren't able to have our youth leader meeting last week and so we're actually gonna do it today, right after Young Adult Small Group. So if you're a young adult, please be there for that. We'll talk about some important stuff. And that's all I have for us. Uh, other than that, that's all I have. And uh, today we are continuing our sermon series, Flex, looking at the life of Samson. And this week the message is titled, A Bad Haircut. So let's get started, enjoy. Good morning once again and thank you for joining me this morning as we open God's Word together. We all know what it's like to get a bad haircut, right? I'm sure you've experienced bad haircuts in the past. Uh, either maybe you did it yourself because you just got sick of you know your hair and you just decided to cut it uh, or maybe you thought it'd be a good idea to go to a barber shop and get something new done to your hair, you know, spice things up a little bit uh, and then you ended up regretting your haircut afterwards. Uh, back, back in high school, believe it or not, I actually went bald at one point. I shaved off all of my hair because I thought it would be really fun. Um, and I immediately regretted it. But actually a few weeks ago, so I was in high school, but a few weeks ago, when all the barbershops were closed in Calgary, I got so sick of my long hair that I actually was debating shaving my hair and just going bald. Um, but luckily Chelsea talked me out of it and once barbershops opened up, I was able to get a haircut. But that's the thing with quarantine. This past uh, year, and especially these few months when the barbershops were closed, so many people have just decided to cut their own hair. You know, they just gave up and they just decided to do it themselves. 
And so I actually have a little video of some quarantine haircuts that people have done uh, that they soon regretted right afterwards. So uh, check this out. What do you think? <laughs> I'm a boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I gotta stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Don't go high. <laughs> look at my brother. He has real I think short I like hair. Like this. You like really you like, you like the way it is right now? Uh, yeah, maybe I wanna be done right now. So oh, Gianna, what happened to your hair? I cut it in the don't get in my face. Your hair was in your face? Mm-hmm. Why did you cut your hair? Because some don't get in my face. Can I see your hair, please? Oh my gosh, she forgot to put the guard on. <laughs> Look at that haircut. Mm. How can you do that? Is that gonna work if you comb it over to the side? Yeah. And it'll be all better? Yeah. Why did you choose to cut your hair today? I just my stop taking a break. <laughs> How long have you been doing this, Dom? Four years. You want to school for this? Ashley, what? <laughs> Why do you trust us? It looks great. <laughs> Don't get a out of your hand. <laughs> Man, I just uh, feel so bad for all those people who, who made the mistake of cutting their hair like that, especially those little kids who didn't know any better cut their hair. Their parents are like, why? What did you do? Um, but this morning, we are continuing our series, Flex, looking at the life and person of Samson. Now, Samson's story continues this week, uh, where we're going to be reading about not only his only haircut that he ever got, but also the worst haircut a person could possibly get. Um, the passage we're looking at this morning comes from Judges chapter 16, verses 1 to 21, and today's sermon is called, A Bad Haircut. <laughs> So I invite you to grab your physical Bible if you have one uh, so you can follow along with me or write some notes uh, if you want to do that. Um, this part of Samson's story takes place right after, if you remember from last week, right after a series of back and forth fighting between him and the Philistines. The Philistines were the enemy of Israel. That's who G uh, God had wanted Philistine to destroy. He wanted them to attack the Philistines. And in the last part of Samson's story, we saw that this started to happen. Uh, but uh, Samson wasn't doing it because he wanted to to do what God wanted him to do. He was doing it because he hated the Philistines, so it was kind of a selfish reason. But they started fighting with each other. And the last thing we saw that happened to Samson was he destroyed a army of Philistines with a jawbone. Just one of the coolest stories in scripture. Um, and now we're going to resume his story. And today's passage takes place 20 years later. So um, it's a huge jump, but you know when the TV shows jump from, you know, history to the future and they say like 20 years later? So just imagine 20 years later, okay? And that's where we're going to begin today. So in verse 1, it says this. One day, Samson went to Gaza, a city of the enemy Philistines, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. Now, the people of Gaza were told that Samson is here. So they surrounded the place that he was in and lay waiting for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn, that's when we'll kill him. And then it says in verse 3, but Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. And then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts. And he tore them loose, bar and all. And then he lifted them to his shoulders and he carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So basically, we see that Samson hasn't changed in 20 years. He's the same person, right? He's still chasing after women. And in this case, he's chasing after a Philistine prostitute. 
But what we get is this crazy miracle of sorts where Samson gets up and tears the city gates off their hinges and carries them up a mountain. He's basically taunting the Philistines and saying to them, you can't stop me. Like, I'm the best, right? Um, and I think it's really funny because imagine if you made a friend upset. Say your friend came over to visit and you made them upset and they stormed out of your house and took your front door with them. <laughs> Right? That's kind of like what Samson does to the Philistines here. And in the next part of his story here, we see that Samson is now beginning to be out of control. His sin is out of control. In verse 4, it says this. Sometime later, he fell in love with yet another woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now remember, this dude, Samson, married a Philistine woman. Right? Instead of fighting uh, the Philistines like God wanted him to. And what happened? She ended up betraying him. Right? It didn't end up working out in his favor. Uh, so you can't help but roll your eyes at this next part and say, you know, here we go again. He's making the same mistake again. Verse 5 says this. The rulers of the Philistines went to her. They went to Delilah, uh, Samson's new girlfriend, and said, See if you can lure him, Samson, into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. And then each one of us, if you do this, will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. And Delilah here, she goes, Wow, sweet deal. Imagine how much shampoo I can buy with that many shekels. Right? But seriously, <laughs> they're offering her a lot of money. And so she takes the deal. She's going to betray Samson. So verse 6 says this. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Talk about being like straightforward here. They just met and she's basically asking him for his Facebook password. Right? Like asking for his secrets, uh, yet they had just met. Uh, but Samson, he decides to play a little game with Delilah here. And instead of giving her the answer, he teases her a little bit. So first, he tells her, Oh, if anyone ties me up with seven bowstrings that have not been dried, then I'll be as weak as any other man. And Delilah believes him, and so ties him up with the bowstrings. And the Philistines are hiding, and so Delilah screams, Samson, the Philistines are here. But of course, Samson breaks free uh, from the bowstrings, and nothing happens. So then Delilah gets angry, and she tells Samson, You lied to me. How dare you? Don't lie this time and tell me the truth now. What is the secret to your strength? And so Samson gives her yet another lie. He says, If you tie me up with ropes that have never been used before, that's when I'll get weak. That's when I'll lose my strength. So Delilah tries it, and then again she yells that the Philistines have come, and Samson breaks free because he still has his strength. And so now Delilah's getting really angry. And so Delilah says to Samson, quit lying to me and tell me the truth. Okay, this is now the third time. Uh, and what does he do? Well, he tells another lie, of course. Uh, it's a little closer to the truth because he's getting a little closer. He says it has something to do with his hair here. Uh, but he tells her, if you weave my hair into fabric and then pin it, then I'll become just like any other man. So Delilah tries it and it doesn't work. So third time, doesn't work. So this time she's determined to find out the truth. So she confronts Samson and says, Samson, if you love me like you say you do, then you will tell me the truth. So this time she's kind of giving him a little bit of a threat here. Like, if you love me, if you really love me, then you'll tell me the truth. And so Samson finally comes clean and he tells her that the secret to his strength is his hair and that if his hair is cut off or shaved off, then he loses his strength. And so finally figuring it out, Delilah uh, has Samson fall asleep. He kind of takes a nap and he's sleeping on her, on her lap. Uh, and then she cuts his hair. She shaves his hair. And in verse 20, Samson meets his doom and it says this. Then she, Delilah, called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And Samson woke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him this time. And then the Philistines seized him, they gouged out his eyes, they took him down to Gaza, and binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. This story of Samson's fall from God is one that teaches us really important lessons about the danger of sin. 
The first thing that it teaches us about sin and the dangers of sin is that sinning once makes it easier to sin again. So I'll say that again. Sinning once makes it easier to sin again. No one just wakes up in the morning, at least I hope no one does, <laughs> and says to themselves, you know, today I'm going to rob a bank. You know, I'm just going to decide to rob a bank today. Or, you know, I think I'm going to start a drug addiction today. You know, no one just suddenly wakes up in the morning and just decides to do things like that. Um, Christians tend to think that there are two kinds of sin. That there are big sins and that there are little sins. Um, and big sins would be things like robbing a bank or murder or theft or cheating. Um, they're horrible and of course those aren't things that we as Christians should do. But then Christians tend to compare those big sins to little sins. And they say that the little sins don't really count when you compare them to the big sins. Um, some even say that, you know, they're so little, they're not really sins uh, even. Like exaggerating a story that you tell a friend. Well, it's not as bad as murder, right? So it's not really that big of a deal. Or slamming a door after an argument, okay? It's kind of a sin, but it's a little sin. It's not that bad. Uh, or gossiping about other people behind their backs. Um, so some Christians will say that they're not as bad as those other bigger sins, and so we shouldn't worry about them. But the thing is, is if you actually look at the Gospels, you look at the story of Jesus and the lessons that Jesus taught, it seems to him that he really cares deeply about those little sins that we do. He taught things uh, such as the famous lesson that even if you think badly about someone else, then you've already committed murder in your heart. So the thinking goes, you know, at least I didn't murder them. I might have thought bad things about them, but at least I didn't murder them. So, you know, thinking bad things is just a little sin. It doesn't really matter. But Jesus seems to say, no, it matters just as much as the murder, which is really interesting. And, and so the reason we can't just brush off the little sins is because uh, that's where all those big sins begin. Those little sins, and this is why Jesus teaches this lesson, those little sins open a door to sin again, and it makes it easier to take that sin to the next level. So one of the reasons that Jesus says that even just thinking bad about someone else is like murder is because it starts with your thoughts. It starts with that small sin. Again, nobody just wakes up and just wants to murder somebody all of a sudden. It, it has a chain of sins connected to it. Um, so today, for example, you might think badly about someone else, but the next time you see them, you might call them a name. And then the next time after that, you might find yourself shoving them or pushing them or getting a little bit physical. And then eventually you're fighting them uh, and then you do something you really regret. You see how it started with that small sin and it escalated. So that small sin at the start opened up the door for the bigger sins in the end. And that's what happens with Samson. Throughout his whole story, each time that Samson sinned, it made it easier for him to sin again and in bigger ways. You know, it started with him wanting to marry a Philistine. Then it became him touching a dead lion. Then it became him killing hundreds of innocent people. And then it became him completely abandoning his Nazarite vow by letting his head get shaved. And so all that led to him finally falling away from God uh, in the end of the story and what we read today. And so that's what that first lesson about sin that we learned from Samson in this story is that sinning once makes it easier to sin again. And the second lesson that it teaches us is that you can't run away from the consequences of sin. See, we say that Jesus, by pouring out his blood, and this is true, by pouring out his blood, Jesus has removed your sin. God doesn't count your sin against you anymore if you've repented of it and turned to Jesus and received his salvation. He has forgiven you and he has died for you. But the consequences of sin still exist. The consequences of your sin still remain. See, Jesus, he removes the stain of sin on us when we turn to him, but he can't remove the pain or the damage that your sin has already caused. If you lie to someone or say something nasty, 
Jesus will certainly forgive you if you ask for forgiveness, but he can't undo the hurt that you have caused that other person. You might not be able to reconcile with them. You might have damaged your relationship uh, beyond the point of being able to come together and be friends again. Uh, another example would be like crossing a line with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Jesus can forgive you of that sin, but he can't undo it. And that mistake you made with that person that you were dating is now that, that act, that mistake is going to be carried into your future marriage. You're going to have to talk about it with your spouse that you made that mistake back in the day. And so that's why even our little sins are serious. We might not think much of them right in the moment or right now, but not only does it open a door for more sin, but it also damages relationships as well as our own hearts. See, Samson, he sinned carelessly for 20 years and it all led him down this path to ultimately having his whole life fall apart. And so sin, what we see is that sin may bring you temporary happiness, temporary pleasure. It might be enjoyable for a second, but the consequences of that sin will eventually um, come to be. They will eventually catch up to you. And even when you receive forgiveness, the damage that your sin has caused still remains. You have, still have to live with those consequences. So again, we see these two things in the story that we read about Samson today. First, sinning once makes it easier to sin again. And second, you can't run away from the consequences of your sin. In other words, and I'll sum it all up in this one phrase, and if you walk away with anything this morning, walk away with this, okay? Sin may seem like no big deal in the moment, but it always ends up hurting you in the end. I'll say that again. Sin may seem like no big deal in the moment, but it always ends up hurting you in the end. See, the Bible is full of a whole list of do's and don'ts. There are about 613 commandments in the Old Testament, and then there's over a thousand more in the New Testament. And it almost seems like God is trying to ruin our fun. Like he's just given us all these rules to follow. And he's just trying to ruin our lives and, may, and you know, steal joy and happiness from us. Um, I mean, there's so many things that all of us wish we could do, but God says not to. And the reason why is not because God wants to ruin your life, but instead he came to give you life. The reason why he wants us to follow these commands is because Christ, God, he wants to protect us. He wants what's best for us. He knows that sin causes pain, that sin causes destruction, that sin leads to death. And so he has given us this book not to ruin our fun, but to protect us and to keep us on the path of righteousness. So again, he didn't come to ruin your life. Jesus came to give you life. And we find life when we follow in his example. I don't know if there's any snakes in Korea. I've never been to Korea, okay? So I, I have no idea. Maybe there are snakes, maybe there aren't. Uh, we don't have very many snakes here in Alberta. Uh, but I know in Australia, there's this uh, YouTuber that I watch, or these YouTubers, uh, it's called How Ridiculous, and they throw things off of a really tall tower, and they do a bunch of science experiments. Anyways, they live in Australia, and a lot of times in their videos, there'll be snakes and stuff, and they'll show it. And I'm like, why would anyone want to live in Australia if there's this many snakes? Um, but in some parts of the world, I just learned about this kind of snake. There's this really evil, notorious snake known as the Boom Slang. It has a really cool name, the Boom Slang. Uh, and the reason that this snake is famous, is really popular, is because of its unique venom that it has uh, that makes it especially dangerous. See, what happens is if you get bit by this uh, innocent little green snake, like a snake does not look dangerous at all, and if you get bit by it, you're not going to immediately think anything. You're not going to think that this snake is going to kill you or the venom is dangerous. Uh, you might even get a headache or feel dizzy because it does have an effect on your body. But unlike other snakes whose venom kills you very quickly, the boom slang's venom can take up to five days to start showing symptoms and then eventually kill you. 
Uh, so you might start off with a, some minor symptoms that you might not think anything of, right? You might not think anything really serious has happened. But slowly, as the days go by, the venom spreads through your body and it actually starts to degenerate your organs. And if you don't go to the hospital, if you don't recognize these symptoms right away because they start out so subtly, uh, you actually will start to bleed from your orifices, meaning you'll start to bleed from your gums, from your nose, from your ears. And at that point, once the blood starts coming out, uh, there's nothing you can do and death is right around the corner. So that's why this boom slang snake is really, really dangerous. Um, but sin is just as dangerous. In fact, there's a lot of similarities with sin. Sin is just like this kind of venom. It may not seem like a big deal at first when you, when you commit a sin. It may not cause many problems in your life in the moment, but that first initial sin starts to grow and spread until the sin is pouring out of your mouth and your ears and your nose if you don't address it, if you don't bring it to Jesus. It eventually spreads and starts to poison your whole body. And the end result is not pretty. Let's take looking at pornography on the internet, for example. This is one uh, that church very rarely talks about, but it's a sin that is very, very common among even young people. So let's just take it as an example, okay? Um, one day you might be innocently scrolling through TikTok, whatever, and, and you come across an inappropriate video. You didn't actually purposely go to it. It just kind of popped up and, and you watched it. Okay. And you might tell yourself, it's okay. It's not a big deal because it, you know, it's not like you looked it up. It's not like you went to a pornography website or anything like that. And you only watched it for a second and then you swiped it, swiped it away. Um, but that's like the first initial bite of the boom slang. Okay? Choosing to watch it and not swipe away right away is like that first initial bite. Now, the next time you're on your phone, you might start looking at TikTok, scrolling through, hoping to come across another video like that. And, and then maybe when you do come across it, you start watching it for a little bit longer than you did before. And then the sin or the venom starts to spread even more. And now the next time you're on TikTok, you're actually going to the search bar and specifically looking up those kinds of videos. And then sooner or later, you're going to those specific websites that are intriguing your interest. You're Googling things. And eventually, when you don't address it, it grows and grows. And without even fully realizing it, sooner or later, now you have an unhealthy and sinful habit and maybe even an addiction. To pornography. You see how you don't just wake up and all of a sudden you're addicted? It starts with the small sin and it just grows and grows and grows when we don't repent and we leave it on its own. See, James says this about sin. It sounds very similar to venom or poison. He says this, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and action, actually committing the sin. And then sin, when it is full grown, see how he uses that word full grown, eventually gives birth to death and destruction. The good news is that there's an antidote. You can stop it before it's too late, before the venom is fully spread, before sin is fully grown like Samson did uh, in the end, or his sin was fully grown in the end. See, Christ always gives us the option. He always gives us a way out when we're tempted. He always gives us an option to turn to him in our sin. He always provides us with a way out. And just like it's better to see a doctor before the snake venom has spread throughout your body, it's also important for us to go to Jesus at the first sign of sin, not to wait until it becomes a full-blown addiction or, or causes destruction in your life, to go to him before it grows when while it's still small and to offer to him and ask him for forgiveness and ask him to cleanse you of that sin. See, if we address it when it's small and never let it grow into anything bigger, that's when we can reduce the damage and the pain and the hurt that sin can cause in our lives. So before we end this morning, I do want to say this. If you've already had sin in your life that has caused damage in your life, maybe it's turned out and you do have an addiction, or maybe you've done something that you very much regret, I want you to know 
And I want you to, I want to encourage you to trust Jesus, to hold on to Jesus and to know that even if sin has caused damage in your life, it's not too late to bring it to him. And that yes, you might have to deal with the consequences of sin. It might be a struggle now that that sin has grown to be so big. But Jesus promised to us is that he will cleanse us, that he will help us, that he will empower us um, to heal from that sin and to walk away from it fully restored and forgiven. He might not be able to undo the damage that it caused, but he will help you carry the damage. He will help you carry the burden. He will give you strength and hope. And that's his promise to us. And so I invite you, as we finish this conversation with Samson, we have one more week in his story. But as we finish this talk about sin, I want to invite you right now, whether you have small sin or big sin in your life, I want to give you the opportunity right now. Let's go to Jesus and let's ask for forgiveness and let's ask for his help as we try and strive to be like him in our lives and live lives of righteousness. So I invite you right now to bow your heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now. Our amazing, gracious, and loving Savior and King. We want to say sorry this morning for making life about our own happiness, for making life about our own pleasure. We are sorry, Lord Jesus, for all the ways that we sin against you and make other things priority. And we're sorry for all the ways we continue to fall short. So we ask for forgiveness this morning, Lord Jesus. Forgive us for it all. Help us to turn from our sin and hold on to you and your hope and the life that you offer us. And may our lives reflect who you are. May you continue to heal, restore, and change us to be more like you each day. We know that as we follow you, every single day we become more like you. And so we thank you for your message. We thank you um, for your faithfulness to us, even though we still struggle with sin. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your salvation that you have won for us. And we want to pray all of this in your name for your sake and for your glory, Lord Jesus. Again, we pray this in your name. Amen. Okay.